First John chapter number four is where I'd like to begin reading this morning. You know, you and I were meant to live a victorious life. And God has great things in store for the believer that takes his word seriously, that takes the word of God seriously, takes the anointing seriously. And the way to determine whether or not you take the word seriously, I mean, only you can self-evaluate as, as we all do, you know. That, that's the way it kind of needs to be. You know, you kind of wake up every day and go, God, what are you doing in me? Uh, where, God, God where, where can I continue to grow? Uh, God, God, show me my spiritual weak points so that I can begin to develop in those things. And you identify those things through time and attention in the Word of God. Time and attention uh, in worship and praise and time with the Holy Spirit. And in order to measure, I guess you could say, the seriousness of your walk with God would be how much time you spend with it. Now, if you were to ask me, Pastor Quest, do you love golf? The answer is yes. Uh, how, how would you know that? By how much time and attention I give it. Now, I, I wish I could give it more time, I would just, just say. Uh, I, I'm believing for an increase in a golf anointing. I don't know if that, if that exists, but I am believing for it. And, um, but how, how you know you're serious about a thing or how you know you love a thing, you're passionate about a thing, is how much time you're willing to spend with that thing. In this case, referring to the things of God. Everybody here with me this morning? Now, in 1 John chapter number 4 is where I want to begin. It says this, you are of God. Okay. Say that, I am of God. God. Say it one more time, I am of God. I am of God. It says in verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Listen to this, because he who is in you, listen to this, don't miss this. He who is in you is greater Somebody say greater. greater, 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 because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I want you to understand something that the spirit of God, the nature of God that you and I are always growing in and developing is greater in potency and potential than the things you'll find in the world. Somebody, one more time, say the word greater. greater. Greater, greater in potency and potential. When the Word of God is activated and the Spirit of God is at work and on the move in your life, there is potency and potential that begins to set things in motion. Wednesday night we talked about spiritual law. There are, there are things that begin to take place through spiritual law, through the activating of the word, through the activating of your faith, because of the word. If I took this microphone, Miss Stacy, and I just dropped it, we all know it ain't going to fly up there. Why? It ain't full of helium. Come on, somebody. I haven't taught my kids to suck in a little helium and see how their voice changes. How many of y'all ever did that as a kid? Don't look at me like I'm cuckoo. You know you did it. But if I drop this mic, the mic's going straight to the ground. Why? Law. It's called the law of gravity, right? Everything I drop, it, it will go straight to the ground. There is spiritual law as well at work when you begin to move in and, and, and work in the Word of God, spending time with the Spirit of God. Things just begin to shift and to change. Direction, which I'm walking through, direction begins to change. Some of y'all have dealt with it too. Some of y'all have been redirected and made your way right on back. Come on, somebody. You, there, there are things, there's redirecting, there's course correcting. Sometimes, maybe I should say all the times, there's rebuking. There's, there's, um, there's the Holy Spirit beginning to work. And you go, man, I got I to gotta fix that. I need to adjust that in my life. I, I want to make the point that what's on the inside of you is greater in potency and potential than what you will ever find out in the world. That's what's so special about the life of a believer. You are carriers 
of something extremely powerful. Somebody say that. Powerful. Come on. You're a carrier of something incredibly powerful. Amen. And it says, because he who is in you is greater. One last time before we move from this scripture to another. Somebody say greater. Greater than he who is in the world. Nothing happens, changes or shifts in the natural without a believer exercising and activating spiritual law. Spiritual law. Sp- spiritual law. I, there was a movie that had come out um, maybe several years ago, but it began with a story. It's a true story uh, about a woman whose son was playing with his friends uh, on ice. And they were playing on ice and uh, he had slipped. The ice had begun to crack. He fell through the ice and went into the water. And as you can imagine, uh, when the surface is ice, it's cold underneath, uh, underneath that layer of ice. And so the water, as he began to fall in, was so cold that he couldn't actually make his way out of the water. It was so cold, in fact, that his muscles begin to, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, ooh, I, I can't even, ugh. You, you just, it was so cold that his muscles would, um, uh, I don't know what the word seize, would, he, would, he would freeze himself and he couldn't, and you can imagine falling into water that cold the way it, the way it, it shocks you, the, the way it, it takes your breath away. And he falls through the ice and his little buddies weren't able to get him out in time. And so as uh, rescuers begin to come and rescue him and begin to uh, do what they can to warm him, they hauled him out, took him to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, they realized there's no hope for this for this kid. I mean, that he's, he's so far gone, he's barely alive anymore. And in fact, they said that there was so little brain activity after having spent so much time in the freezing cold temperature, there was so little brain activity that even if, even if we could resurrect this boy, we could get his heart beating again, we, we could warm him up, we can thaw him out, we can save his limbs, we can pull him out of this freezing situation into more of a normalcy in his body. His, his brain was so seriously affected that even if they resuscitated him, brought him back to life, he would never be the same again. Even if, somebody say even if. Even if they were able to bring him back to life, uh, it wouldn't have been the same. They, there was an awareness that even, even, if, even if they had resuscitated him, brought him back to life, the reality was is his brain had been shut off. He had been dead for too long that even if he was to come back to life, there would most likely be brain damage upon his coming back to life. And so even if, he, even, even if, he came back to life. He wouldn't awaken the same person. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know him like you used to know him. E- even if he came back, you, you, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't work the same. He'd have to rehab muscles again. We don't know that he'd be, he'd be able to walk again. All this is happening, and mom gets a phone call. And the mother of this boy who had fallen through the ice gets a phone call about what had taken place. Where, where they brought him to, what the status is. And all they told, him, uh, told her on the phone was, uh, it's not good. It's not good. This, this isn't good. And she gets in her car right away. She heads to the hospital. And while she's driving, she begins to rehearse things that the Lord had begun to speak to her about regarding her son previously. And... She began to remember prophetic words. She began to remember things that she felt like the Lord was speaking to her about concerning her son. So much so that what was happening in that moment didn't jive with mom. It didn't jive with her at all. Why? Because what I'm seeing right now looks nothing like what God said concerning my son. And so while she's driving, she's rehearsing things. God, you, you, you said this about him. 
You said he'd grow up to become that. You, you said, God, you said, you told me. I've, I'm, I've been standing on your word. I've been standing on the promise. I've been, I, what? What? And so while she's driving, she begins to rehearse these things and she finally gets to the hospital and something unique came over her. I'll put it that way. Unique. That's, that'll be the word that we use. Something unique came over her where she moved from a grieving, mourning, saddened, frustrating mother of a now dead son due to an accident to a mother bear. How many of y'all know the difference between a mother and a mother bear? Any moms in the house have a clue what I'm talking about? Come on, you go from mother to, to, to mama bear to mother bear. Come on, somebody. And so on the drive, she had begun rehearsing what God had said, then began to speak what God had said. And I'm not just talking about, you know, a couple of favorite scriptures that, that, are, that, are, that are good and powerful and potent and apply to this situation. Yes, but also words from God specific to her son and now to her son's situation. So now as she's pulling into the hospital, she walks in. And she is so well rehearsed on that drive. What God said concerning her son. So much so that when she got to the hospital, she wasn't in funeral mode. She, she wasn't in, let's cry and pick. She was not in that mode at all. She went to that hospital ticked. Come on, somebody. Angry. Angry. And she walked in there and the, Story goes that she had went into that room and as she was allowed in, they brought her in and she could see her son laying on that table. Something came over her that wasn't, <laughs> oh, my son, oh, I'm going to miss him. God, God, God. And you know what? She had every right to do that. I can't even imagine getting that call. I, I cannot even imagine receiving that phone call. And as she went into that room, something different came over her. And she began to become a different person. Somebody say this after me. Spiritual law. Spiritual. Come on, say it again with some fervor and some power. Spiritual law. There are things set in motion by the Spirit of God that even ice can't stop. That even freezing temperatures can't stop that lots of money and no money can stop that nobody any shape size can stop there are things in motion in the great last days against the body of Christ some of which we're beginning to see unfold where Israel's concerned etc cetera, etc cetera. There, there are things that you are seeing, things you're walking through, things you, you may yet to walk through. And I want to encourage you with something before I finish that story. Don't let me forget the story. Don't let me forget the story. Because I think you know what happened. That spiritual law set in motion will begin to change and adjust for your life. Come on, somebody. So mom, mom walks in there, and before she's even greeted by the doctors, it was like, the parting of the Red Sea, you, you get out of my way. And she began to shout and scream. She would scare every Baptist right out of that hospital room. I don't know what denomination this fell under, but it got the job done. Somebody say it needs to get the job done. Well, that's not the way we do it. Who cares how you thought you should do it? H how did they do it here? So she begins to walk into that room. And she took a little something called spiritual authority over that situation. Somebody say that after me, spiritual authority. Do you have it? Now I'm going to ask it again. I don't want you to answer me verbally. Do you have it? No, it's okay. I know it's hard. Especially when I'm like, come on, amen me. Come on, say something. Come on. It's hard not to. I, no, you're good. 
Now I just want you to think about it. Do you have it? Do, do I have it? I know I'm supposed to have it. And I know to say amen when I'm asked. But when the rubber meets the road, do I have it? Am I operating in it? Do I even believe in it? I'm amazed today at how many unbelieving believers there are in the body of Christ. Regarding the potency and power of the word of God. And so she, she goes in and she begins to go into spiritual authority, mama bear mode, and she begins to shout and declare the works of the Lord over her son. And would you know it? Nothing happened. She had to move on and begin planning and preparing for what would be a memory. And that ain't what happened at all. Come on, y'all. Come on, somebody. She began to take spiritual authority over this situation. And what she had on the inside of her was words from God concerning her son that was so settled on the inside of her that ice or anything else could come against her son. And all of it was a lie and contradicted the potential and the future that God had promised her concerning her son. What do you do when you're looking at something, facing something, walking through something that totally contradicts what God said about you, what God said about your situation, what God said about your family, what God said you can have, what God said you can do. Come on, is anybody in the house today? There's, there is authority in the spirit realm that you and I are to engage in every single day. I, I heard this uh, kind of a quote and a joke the other day, and it was a sign that the, a church put up for Easter, and it said, Easter comes once a year, just like most of you. Right there on the front lawn. That's probably not the top three keys to church growth. I don't think that that's going to work at all. I think it was a fun, it was, it was really funny. But the point is, is you can't, combat full-time devils with part-time Christianity. I think I might. You, you, you can't combat full-time darkness with part-time Christianity. You can't combat full-time darkness in, in the culture with a laid-back, kick-back, Bible Belt Christianity. It doesn't get anything done. No, it don't get nothing done. It's boring. It's dull. There's no fire. You get used to what you have access to. There's something about understanding that a relationship with God, not on occasion, but on the regular, is what it's going to take for you and I to begin to grow and to begin to develop into everything. Somebody say everything. everything. Into everything God's called us to do and to be in the world today. Because He who is in you, is greater than that ice, than any, any threat that comes against your life, your ministry, your business. Can I get a good amen today? Amen. amen. The 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. If you'd turn over there quickly, I'll release in just about two hours, and then we'll... It's a walk of faith. It's a walk of faith. Now, we'll release in just a few moments. 2 Corinthians chapter 10... Verse number three says, for though we walk in the flesh, you're a human, I'm a human, you've got a heartbeat, you got to wake up, do your hair, brush your teeth. Some of us take longer than others. Some of y'all won't look at your neighbor. Husbands, don't look over at your wives. Okay. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to that flesh. Somebody say that with me one more time. Spiritual law. When the devil comes knocking, it don't matter how much ammo you got in your back closet. That, that, don't, that don't do the job. That, 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 that might do the job in one sense, but how many of you know that's good to have and 
This is Texas, son. If you don't have a closet full of ammo, I, I don't know who, I don't, okay. But, uh, but it, there, there, there is flesh and physical things and there's spiritual things. And you can't wage spiritual warfare by cussing and spitting and, and, and shooting bullets at the air, you know. It don't work that way with spiritual law. And so it goes on to say, for though we walk in the flesh, there's no denying that we are, we're human, we're flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4 says, for the weapons of our warfare, somebody say, our warfare, showing you some contrast between the way, you know, the world does things and the way the body of Christ was instructed by the Spirit of God to do things. It says, now, for the weapons of our warfare... You still good? You with me? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. There's that word again, flesh, natural. But mighty in God. What for? For pulling down strongholds, spiritual strongholds. Now in verse 5, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against, listen to this, the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. That right there is what Mama Bear yielded to. The knowledge of the Word of God. Not simply the visual of the circumstance she found herself in. What do you do when what you see looks nothing like the knowledge of the Word of God you and I have deposited and imparted on the inside of us? And you find yourself sometimes, if you're anything like me, just we're just humans, at forks in the road. Where it's faith versus fear, faith versus flesh, spirit of God, the word of God, the voice of the Lord versus what you see. Carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. The knowledge of the word of God will cast down anything that contradicts it, so long as you're full with it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Verse 5, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself up against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This scripture here is the epitome of exercising spiritual law. That is what shifts things, changes things in the natural. It is setting spiritual law in motion. One more time, just to irritate the devil, somebody say spiritual law. Are you okay in this place? You good today? Spiritual law. You got time for one more scripture before we release? Ah, that's the right answer. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 17. Let's, let's turn over there real quickly before we gear up to, dis, to dismiss this morning. What a powerful time in God's house. Man, I like playing the drums during worship. Just don't look at the facial expressions I make as I play because I cannot account for those faces. I play it the way I feel it, and I enjoy it. And so we had a good time. First Samuel chapter 17. I want to I pick up in a particular story I know you've heard, you've read, especially if you've grown up in church for any particular length of time. This is a very familiar passage uh, in the life of David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to pick up in verse number 49. And as you hold your place there, I want to zoom out just a little bit. If you know the narrative or some of this passage regarding the life of David, you may remember when he was anointed by the prophet in front of his family. And it was a little awkward because he wasn't even... Man, he wasn't even accounted for that day. When the prophet had come to Jesse, David's father, to Jesse's house, because he believed by the Spirit of God that the future leader, the future king would come out of that home. And so he began to line up these sons. And the prophet begins to size up these sons. Well, you, you know, you, you dress well, you look like a leader. Okay, you got a good haircut. You know, your ears are a little, you know, your earlobes are a little big, okay, but 
You, you know, they, he began to size up the boys. And as he's sizing up all of these sons, David being one of them, though David wasn't there, David was out working. Now, there's more to this sto story concerning David and his biological relationship to this family I don't have time to teach on today. However, I think there's other reasons why David was way over there and all the golden boys were lined up. But I don't got time for that today. David's out and he's shoveling poop and he's dealing with animals and he's doing his job. All of these boys are lined up and the prophet comes and nothing, nothing hits on the inside. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There just wasn't an unction on the inside. I'm, where are all my church people at? You use the word unction. Come on, somebody. What the heck's an unction? That's half of the word function. I don't, I don't know. But, but there, there was something on the inside that just, it just, I'm looking at all these boys. And, mm. and so Jesse, excuse me, the prophet says to the dad, Jesse, there's got to be, is there another? Sure enough. Somebody say, sure enough. Sure enough, there was another. So David was out in the field and the narrative goes that they brought David in and it, 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 it began to bear witness with the prophet that this is the one. This is the one. And now you have David standing before his family and he's being anointed with the horn of oil, the Bible says in it. They didn't just do a little, you know, like we, we do today. or and Nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a little cleaner. But in this situation, they, they, they soaked him. They immersed him with oil as a symbol of the anointing, immersing him. You are being prepared for a future assignment. Here's what I want you to see. Once he was anointed with oil, aggravated all of his brothers, and, and begin to uh, recognize what he was being anointed for, do you know what he did from there? He went over to Dallas to the mall, went and got himself a Louis wallet and a Versace belt, and he's getting himself, he's like, man, I'm going to be the future king. So, I'm going to go shop. I'm gonna, no, he didn't do any of that. You know what he went back to doing? All the good stuff. <laughs> Anointed for a future assignment, yet was still found faithful in the current season he was in. Concerning transition, can I help somebody today? Some of us crave transition, but you're not faithful in the current moment you're in. And God wants to see you faithful in the moment you're in as you're being prepared to transition into a new assignment, a new level of anointing, whatever that thing is. But David, having been anointed, knew he was not yet appointed. And he, he goes back to doing what he's doing. Well, one day, they're at, they're at battle. And Jesse calls for David and says, David, I want you to bring some cheese and some bread. I want you to take it over to your brothers and, and the men there, and I want you to come back with a report and tell me how they're doing. How are things going? Well, you know what David's response was? What am I, your pizza boy? Don't you know who was anointed to be a future king? I, I still smell like oil, Dad. I, I still smell like that frankincense and myrrh oil that you can get at christianbook.com or wherever you can get all the, oil, all the oils. But, but I... He said, he didn't say any of that. You got it. Let's go. Well, you're talking about the future king. You're talking about the future man. Wasn't even invited to battle. It's kind of insulting in a way. So he, he's faithful in his current assignment. So he begins to grab the cheese. He begins to grab the bread. He takes it over there. And most of you know the story from there, David. Now something's begin to bubble up on the inside. And this is where we pick up in 1 Samuel 17, verse 49. Something begins to rise up on the inside of David concerning what's taking place. Sometimes you can be in a moment of transition where you, have, you carry one mantle and you're being moved and shifted into a, a next mantle, another mantle, maybe an additional mantle. And this was a mantle 
transition for David, not just a moment of arrogance and ambition. This was a mental moment. Somebody say mental moment. Because if, if you don't recognize a mental moment and just look at it as transition, you will have missed it. Say it again. Mental moment. Mental moment. We're going to read a mental moment in the life of David. This just took... Mental moment. One more time. Somebody say mental moment. Now in 1 Samuel 17, picking up in verse... 49, David having made the decision, I'm going after this joker, Goliath, okay? Goliath is going to go bye-bye, okay? So, so David gets aggressive and says, I'll, I'll, have, I'll, I'll, I'll take my hand at him. He's offered, he's offered armor. He's offered, y'all, so most of y'all know the story. He's, all right, you're going to have to use my sword. You're going to have to use my shield. You're going to need to wear my shoes, and you're going to need to do it the way I would do it. Well, hold on, hold on. Am I going to be your puppet or flow in my own dead gum anointing? Hello? Mental moment. M mental moment. And so, in verse 49, then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. In preparation for sticking his hand in to pull out a stone, how many of y'all know the story? He reached down and David scooped up, the Bible says, five smooth stones in preparation for this mantle moment. Here's what I want you to notice before I read the rest of this scripture. That wasn't the only thing David was packing. We read that David reached down and grabbed five smooth stones. That is... Natural weaponry. Get it, have it, have it on hand, have it ready. But I want you to see that there was something greater on the inside of David. And that greater on the inside of David is what allowed him to move forward in the capacity in which he did in this mental moment. It says, then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. And it goes on to say, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. In verse 50 it says, so David prevailed over the Philistine. Somebody say prevail. 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 I want to say this. It wasn't the rock that killed Goliath. It was David's faith in God's ability to get this thing done. Hallelujah! Man, I feel, I'm feeling charismaniac right now. I'm telling you. And here's why. Here's why. Because if you back up in Scripture, Goliath said, what are you going to do about it? And David spoke with his mouth. He said, you come at me with weaponry. You come at... Notice David used weaponry too. I'm going somewhere with it. Goliath said to David, y'all are coming at me with spear. You're coming at me with this. You're, David then begins to speak to Goliath and says, you're coming at me, you're coming at me, and they're, they're squaring up. And at this point, David said the smartest thing he could have done. And this is how you know, this is a man that spent time with God. Because when the squeeze was on, what he was soaking up was the first thing to come out. Woo! Hallelujah! He began to say this. David said this in response. Everybody here this morning, you're still shocked at my announcement. Amen. Come on. Get it together, church. Let's go. David said, you come at me with natural weaponry, but I stand before you in the name. Somebody say the name. You got you to gotta have, you got to bring the name into things. You, you got to bring the Spirit of God into the mix of things. Here's what I want you to notice. David made it spiritual before things got physical.
David made it spiritual before anything got physical. Did it get physical? Yes or no? Yeah. He acknowledged God first. And I believe with all my heart that even in this mantle moment and season of transitional anointing for David, in this moment he, he was catapulted into the next for him. It was the way he honored God and brought God into, especially in this moment. Now, we all know David had some, some issues and walked through some things. Not like all y'all, not like us. You know, we're all good. But David, David had the issues. Only David, you know what I mean? You know, but I'm so impressed with the way David made it spiritual before he ever slung anything at Goliath's head. I want to encourage you to get God in the mix in every endeavor you ever embark on. Make it spiritual before you make it physical. I had a couple who lived near us that had relocated to another city because they had believed that this is what God instructed them to do. And they had reached out to us as their pastors to just say, hey, we kind of wanted to uh, let you know what was going on. And uh, I have learned as a pastor... And um, growing up in the ministry and being able to kind of watch things take place, seldom do people come to you for your input in prayer. They come to you to tell you. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I didn't come for you, hey, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm praying on, and I'm submitting this to you. I, I don't think I've ever heard that, not once. They come to me to tell me what they're doing. And, uh, you know, not... I want you to be led, even if I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to lose you. But we, one, at one time we had a family that was relocating for a ministry assignment, and everything on the inside of me was like, mm-mm, 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 no, mm-mm. But I knew as I sat at that table, they didn't even ask to see, to see if I sensed anything. So... I guess I could make them mad and go, mm, something about this stinks. Something about this just doesn't jive. It just, the same thing that the prophet felt when David came into the room. A yes on the inside, a yes in the spirit. When this family had come, come to us, this was some time ago, of course, and, and they had left and as they went to this new place, everything fell apart. Now, of course, I, nobody could have really predicted the fullness of some of these things. Their business began to crumble, issues in the marriage, issues with their family. We're actually not sure where we're going to go to church. This didn't work out. That didn't come together the way we thought. This, and I'm thinking, the whole time I'm thinking to myself, if you would have just come for prayer instead of with a made-up mind, and actually lean into the spiritual elders of your life, the Spirit of God can spare you from a lot of dumb mistakes. Come on, somebody, ever been there? And they had eventually called to say, hey, we're moving back, and we're going to have to rebuild our business. We're, going to have to re we're literally having to come back. We've lost what we had. It's not the same. And God began to course correct God begin to redirect. Now, God can lead you on to new paths and different things. As long as it's God, the blessing will begin to follow. And they knew immediately, man, we missed it. And we're coming home. Come on, somebody. How many of you, instead of head down, tail between the legs, I know I missed it, but I'm too embarrassed to call and say and come home? Come on, you know what I'm talking about? I mentioned that story just because there, there is a yes in the spirit concerning seasons of shifts and chains, transitions, mantle moments. And if you don't have time with the spirit of God, you will ignore his voice because you saw something shiny. Kind of like my kids at the mall. I got something better in store. I've got, I'm leading you over here and you saw something shiny. And so you want, come on somebody. The voice 
of the Lord is something to be acknowledged and listened to at all times and the sensitivity to the things of God and the Spirit of God will come. I'm getting ready to dismiss. Will come through time and attention in the Word of God. Somebody say that after me. Time and attention. Time and attention. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. Things that were once complicated and dry and difficult become easy when you let the things of God in. Amen. So today I want to encourage you as we get ready to dismiss let the Spirit of God begin to direct your path. Begin to lead you into the fullness of everything you're called to do and to be. Let Him lead you. Let Him guide you. Spend that time and attention with Him so that there is no voice stronger than the voice of the Lord. When you know you've heard from the Spirit of God. There's, there's just, there's nothing else I'm so fully persuaded. There's nothing else I could possibly hear that could talk me out of what God had ordained for me. And I believe today under the sound of my voice, you can go ahead and put your stuff down. Let's go ahead and stand if you can as we get ready to dismiss and I submit the service back over. God has a great plan. And I want to leave you with some of my favorite things Oral Roberts once said, Make no small plans. Make no small plans. I'm going to say it again just to stir your spirit. Make no small plans. A.A. A. Allen used to say, think big, believe big, talk big, and do big in Jesus' mighty name. I'm believing for a resurgence of old wells and anointings coming into and back to this region to begin to stir the hearts of people back towards God in a unique way, in a, in, in a way that, that, that can't be measured the way it used to be measured, but an anointing that would begin to flourish in a more powerful way in this city and in this region in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, lift a hand to heaven all over this room and receive that by faith right now. Say this after me, I receive it today. In Jesus' mighty name. Say it again. I receive that anointing today. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to take just a moment before we release. If you're in the room or maybe you're catching us online. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. Man, there's nothing like just surrendering everything and saying, God, have your way in my life. Would you say this prayer after me, church family? Let's go ahead and say this together. Say, dear Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my life. Make me new again so that I can live again. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I choose this day to live for you every day from this day forward. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, can we give everybody who prayed that prayer today a great big God bless you. We're so thankful for you. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer today, would you just put it in the chat? Just say, I prayed that prayer today. And uh, we're going to get ready to dismiss. I want to say another quick prayer over you as you're getting ready to leave today back into homes and workplaces. Uh, it's very important that you are hyper aware of Psalm 91. And read it and declare it over your family. Begin to read it and declare it over, over your children, over their schools. Begin to read it and declare it over your cars. Hallelujah. Declare it over your car. Declare it over your home. Father, I thank you no fire, no rain, no elements will have its way on my home in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you that safety and protection, your angels surround about and keep us safe. Protect us, keep us free from harm's way in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, you begin, see, do you feel that rise up on the inside of you as you begin to declare that by faith? I want to encourage you as we go into this new week, begin to declare Psalm 91 over your life, over your home, your family, your ministry, your business. 